So it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker this evening. Stacy Jessamin Donate is Senior Counsel with JFK Law Corporation in Victoria, British Columbia, where she works with Indigenous peoples on matters of business, economic development, and cultural heritage. She is an expert in dispute resolution and has a wealth of experience in cultural heritage protection and repatriation. She has developed and taught courses at Stanford University that examine the illicit trait in art and cultural heritage, and she's an active member of the international nonprofit Lawyers Committee for Cultural Heritage Preservation. Ms. Jessamine Donato holds a Bachelor of Arts from Stanford University, a Juris Doctor from the University of Toronto, and a Master of Laws from the University of British Columbia. Please join me in welcoming Stacey Jessamine Donato. Thank you very much, Nancy. <clears throat> I want to start by thanking both Nancy and uh, Maureen Warren for inviting me here to speak at this prestigious uh, institution uh, located on Illini uh, ancestral territory. I'm very honored to be here with you and very excited about exchanging ideas and thoughts with you uh, during my talk, if you want, and, and there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end. So um, please feel free to engage heavily in the subject matter. Um, I want to start um, by outlining the thesis of my talk for you, which is that while much progress has been made, there are still some important gaps in and differences between museum and auction house approaches to provenance research and return of looted Jewish and indigenous treasures. Um, and that's caused by the slowness of many nation states, not all, and some are better than others, but, um, and the international community to fully acknowledge the atrocities committed to those peoples and to adequately provide binding legal mechanisms um, to redress those atrocities through provenance research and through return of those people's treasures. So the US actually, unlike other nations, has passed important legislation uh, in the past two decades, and recently also in the last few years, addressing these issues. Um, but as I will discuss this evening, the legislation has flaws that, that need to be addressed. And what I'm trying to do in this talk is to uh, explore how indigenous and Jewish peoples looted treasures are treated in both legal and ethical frameworks, both in the US and internationally, and the, the way they're treated differently and why. So I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour, um, sort of a little, might feel a little all over the place, but I'm trying to bring everything together so that we're going to examine them holistically. Um, of the development of legal and ethical frameworks in these two areas during the last 70 years, and by weaving into this some case studies uh, that I hope will illustrate um, some of the issues, I, I'm hoping to create a basis for our discussion during the Q&A session. So first, a few definitions. Uh, I use the term restitution in my talk when I talk about return to Jewish peoples and the rightful owners of, or their heirs of Nazi looted works of art. I use the term repatriation when I'm speaking of return to indigenous nations, communities, or individuals of illicitly acquired sacred and cultural objects. Uh, I use the term return uh, loosely to refer to both repatriation and restitution. I do it through ease. It's not at all a comment on, um, on or a judgment uh, uh, on the words themselves. I'm just grouping those two terms together when I use the word return. And um, I use the word treasures to mean tangible works of art. So there's lots of kinds of intangible uh, cultural heritage that has been taken from indigenous nations. Um, in this talk, I'm using the word treasures to talk about tangible, so things you can touch, works of art, uh, paintings, drawings, sculptures, sacred objects like Torah um, for Jew Jewish peoples, indigenous ceremonial regalia like masks, rattles, clan hats, pipes, and medicine bags, other indigenous material like baskets, totem poles, um, all of which are important to the continuity of indigenous cultures and, and, and Jewish peoples, and which need to be understood holistically as comprising, especially for indigenous peoples, a, a, a totally interconnected relationship between land, resources, religion, art, politics, 
sustainable economies. Everything's connected in indigenous um, uh, communities. So to properly discuss the importance of that material to the identity and the cultures of the people from whom they were taken and the terrible harms that their illicit removal inflicted on those peoples would take much longer than this talk. <laughs> it, would, it would take weeks and weeks, but um, I'll try to give just some highlights, and, and, and I'll, I apologize for my inability to do that justice. So what do I mean by provenance research? <clears throat> so the catalog for um, the really great exhibition that Nancy Carrolls was curating, Provenance, a Forensic History of Art, provides a useful description of that term. Provenance research, she says, is a forensic method that reconstructs legal chains of ownership to establish an artwork's whereabouts from the moment of its creation to its present circumstances. So provenance research requires a really creative, multidisciplinary detective work. You're, if you're a provenance researcher, you're a detective, and you're working with lots and lots of different kinds of materials and in lots of different places. You're looking at looted art databases, art dealer records, collector databases, exhibition catalogs, exhibition labels on the backs of paintings. Sometimes they're half there, sometimes there's a scrap left. Artists and collectors' marks, catalog raisonné of, of artists' works, genealogy and immigration records, uh, oral histories in indigenous communities, photo archives, the list goes on. It's very, very in-depth, time-consuming detective work. And the success of that work relies heavily uh, on past careful documentation. Uh, if, you, if you want to successfully litigate, for example, you need the documentation um, and you're relying on careful documentation practices by collectors, dealers, anthropologists, missionaries, galleries, auction houses, museums, academic institutions that acquired Jewish and indigenous looted treasures. But for various reasons, there are large gaps in the provenance of much of the treasures, especially removed from indigenous peoples during the period of massive collecting by collectors and missionaries, anthropologists, and colonial government forces, and others. And that period of massive collecting on Canada's northwest coast, for example, was sort of the mid to late 19th century to the early 20th century. Um, an explanation for this um, difficulty in in establishing provenance is provided in part by Rob, Professor Robert Patterson from the University of British Columbia's Allard School of Law. And he says, the scope of such acquisitions was vast in geographical, ethnic, and numerical scope. Many items were gifted or traded, while others were stolen, obtained by force, misunderstanding, or removed as part of the actions of early missionaries and others. We also need to keep in mind that during this period of mass collecting, indigenous communities were enduring devastating harms at the hands of colonial governments, included, including massive land takings, destructions of economies, government bans on cultural ceremonies, that's in both Canada and the US, forced sterilizations, forced removals of children to Indian residential schools and in the US boarding schools, where they were physically, psychologically, and sexually abused and prevented from practicing their traditions and languages. The point of which in Canada, the government admitted, was to kill the Indian in the child. The Canadian Indian residential school system, which was actually fashioned on the US Indian boarding school model, has been the subject of a National Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada for the last decade providing a much needed forum for survivors to tell their stories and for non-native Canadians to acknowledge and work to redress the devastating harms of that system. So against the backdrop of, of this, uh, what has now been recognized by the TRC Commission, cultural genocide, and I also include for you the, term, the definition of genocide because you can see um, how many of those aspects of the definition applied to the residential school system. Against this backdrop, massive amounts of material came out of indigenous communities, and museums subsequently re received collections from the collectors with scant or no information on the artist, owner, community, date, or place, and manner of acquisition. So the scale of looting of Jewish treasures during World War II was also massive. In his book, Holocaust Justice, The Battle for Restitution in America's Courts, 
Professor Michael Basilor tells us that it took almost 30,000 rail cars to transport works of art that the Nazis had looted in Europe back to Germany, which, which, and, and all of that art, art has a modern day value of approximately $20 billion. An estimated 100,000 plus works of art are still missing. As Professor Basilor points out, the art market in the US, which for so long has a opposed regulation and scrutiny, ha had a ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lies approach to provenance of looted works, resulting in many works with telling gaps and inaccuracies in their provenance between 1933 and 1945, making their way into museums um, in the period after the war and up until the point we'll start looking at in the 90s when things started to change. The catalog... Um, the, the, this, the, the catalog of this looting is, is just so incredible, and the person behind it um, was a man called Alfred Rosenberg. Uh, he led the Nazi art looting enterprise um, called the Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg, and, and he was found guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity at the Nuremberg trials, and he was executed in 1946. His prosecution... Um, and then a, a few other things in the, in the 40s and 50s actually led to quite a, a substantial change in, in, in the approach to restitution and provenance research. Uh, and, and we're really looking at the beginning right now uh, of changes, fundamental changes in legal and ethical frameworks. It, and it goes back to this moment. So the, what happened after uh, the Nuremberg trials is the 1948 UN Convention on Genocide was adopted, and then in 1954 we had the Hague Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict that was adopted, and all of this set the stage for these important developments. There are also some, uh, a lot of court cases. I don't have time to go through them. I go through them in my stolen art class um, that I developed with Professor John Merriman at Stanford, um, and there's tons of really interesting and uh, fun ones. I'll, I'm going to go through two or three right now uh, because they, they highlight some of the issues that you need to understand. Um, so the first is a court case called Mensel versus List concerning the Chagall painting Le Paysan à l'échelle, The Peasant and the Ladder. It was seized by Alfred Rosenberg's Nazi looting art unit when the Menzels left uh, fled Paris to the United States in 1941. So its whereabouts between 1941 and 1955 are unknown. Um, in 1955, however, the Pearls Gallery in New York bought the painting um, and sold it later that year to Mr. List. The Menzels had actually been searching for the painting since 1941. They learned about its whereabouts only in 1962, and in 1966, Menzel brought an action to recover the painting. So the Pearls Gallery actually was ultimately ordered by the court to pay the value of the painting to List, which was estimated at that time to be $22,000. It's a good deal. And um, the court actually awarded the painting to Menzel. So the real loser in this situation was the gallery. But the actual case is, is most famous for uh, its discussion of statutes of limitations, meaning the time during which claimants have to bring an action in order not to be time barred. And um, the argument that List's lawyer raised was that New York's three-year statute of limitations had run, and therefore, he said, Menzel had filed too late. So actually, that was a losing argument, because at least until the enactment in December of 2016 of the Holocaust Expropriated Art Recovery Act, uh, New York's statute of limitations rule for Nazi looted art claims was different from almost every other American jurisdiction. Almost everywhere in America is the discovery rule. In other words, the statute of limitations begins to run either when the owner learns or discovers where the painting is, or the owner should have discovered its whereabouts with reasonable diligence. That's the rule in the HERE Act. But the one exception was New York. So New York had what we call the Demand and Refusal Act rule. Demand and Refusal rule means the owner must bring the recovery action within three years of the owner demanding the stolen art's return, and the defendant refuses to return it. So that's what was in place when uh, Menzel brought the claim in 1966 against List. Menzel made the demand, brought his action within the three-year period between his demand and List's refusal, so the statute had not run, and that's why he got the painting back. There's actually uh, a, a, a famous case. It's ongoing. It's been going on for 15 years. 
This is often in the news. You'll see it in the New York Times um, and, and other newspapers. And this, uh, this case actually benefited from the HERE Act um, being passed. So what the HERE Act did, you can see, is there's now in this act a six-year uh, statute of limitations. That's an expansion of the rule. So the HERE Act actually um, applied uh, the discovery rule now to New York. But it's a six-year rule. And what happened is, because of this, uh, actually the Cassers were able to continue their efforts to recover this painting because they benefited from the extension of the time um, bar. Uh, there were also other things that, that happened in the various sort of ongoing litigation. Um, another thing that happened is the Court of Appeal decided that no, um, whereas Spanish law uh, was going to um, prohibit the return based on adverse possession, so they had um, had it for a long time and nobody complained, so they got it. Uh, they, they, um, th that was the reason in, in lower courts that the, that the claim had been, uh, that the courts had decided the claim couldn't go ahead. Um, the, the other thing that happened was this an exam a re-examination of the good faith acquisition of the Spanish Museum of this work. Could they really have acquired it uh, in good faith in view of its history? And so this um, aspect actually comes up in the next case that I'll describe to you, which I find hard to pronounce. I'll give it my best shot. Kunt Samlungen zu Weimar versus Elif Kafan. I'm going to call it the Weimar Museum, um, so I don't hack that anymore. But um, this is what the case is about. The case involved two Durer um, prints, Albrecht Durer's prints, originally owned by the Weimar Museum. They were stolen by an American serviceman in Germany from the Schwarzburg Castle. At the time, it was occupied by the Allies in 1946. They were, this serviceman who stole them then offered the portraits to Elikafan, who paid $450 for the two pictures. Elikafan bought them in good faith. He didn't know much about Durer. And then he went home and he hung the pictures in his home in New York and showed them to people who came to his house for dinner. So 20 years later, 20 years later, someone came to his house and said, oh, those look familiar. Uh, he did the research and found they were of paintings by Durer that had been somehow lost in, during the Holocaust. They are very, very valuable paintings, particularly to the Germans, of course, since Durer is German. And so Elikafan made a public statement saying he would not return them, and his statement was publicized on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, so the litigation starts. The 1969, the Weimar Museum brought suit against Elikafan seeking restitution of the works. To make the long story short, there were a couple of other people trying to bring the claim. They fell out. But the Weimar Museum and Elikafan both filed for summary judgment in 1981. The court granted the museum's motion, directed Elikafan to surrender the paintings, finding the paintings had been stolen in 1945 and the museum was the rightful owner. So the really interesting aspect of this case is that Elikafan, the American, argued that the German rule on good faith purchasers should apply. He was a good faith purchaser. And the museum argued that the American rule on good faith purchasers should apply. So it was backwards. So there are two kinds of legal situations in common law and civil law that are usually treated differently. One is, in common law, you can disinherit your children. Actually, in civil law jurisdictions, it's harder to do that. The other is, in the civil law world, basically the law is on the side of the good faith purchaser. So example, Italy, the, the civil code literally says the good faith purchaser becomes the owner. Um, you have other qu uh, countries in which the question is divided in a couple of different parts. Who gets the painting? Who bears the loss of the value? So that an owner could recover the painting, but maybe the owner has to compensate the good faith purchaser for the value. But keep in mind that the ownership by good faith purchasers is not immediate in civil law countries. So there is usually a time period during which um, something could happen. Three years is in France. Um, after three years, the good faith purchaser of, acquires good title. So, um, so, so back to, to the last painting. So this, was, this came up as an issue um, in this case. And this is the um, issue that will be examined as we go forward is will it, could the museum have acquired this in good faith? Could they have been a good faith purchaser? So anyway, back to the 1990s. So now we're in the 1990s. We've looked at some cases from the 80s. We've gone from the Nuremberg trials through to um, 
to through some court cases, and now we're up to the 1990s. And the 1990s, so the court cases have been bubbling along, right? So there's lots of stuff going on in the news about art, art, art looting and, and looting of, of, um, of Jewish uh, treasures. And, and what happens is um, in the 90s, things start to really explode. So a couple of things happen. Uh, the Art Loss Register publishes or creates a commercial database. See, the Art Loss Register um, and the International Foundation of Art Research do this together, and the Art Loss Register also advertises itself as a company that will search for and recover um, works of art for collectors, insurance agencies, and law enforcement. Um, they become sort of, for a, for a good two decades, the sort of only shop in town, and, and, um, and they have this database that they start um, to put together of looted works. Then um, Lynn Nicholas publishes a bestseller. It's called The Rape of Europa. If you haven't seen the documentary, it's a must-see. The documentary came out in 2006. The book is fantastic. It was, uh, it documented in a really detailed way the removal and discovery and attempts to return uh, 600,000 plus works of art um, the finding of the arts by the Monuments Men teams in the salt, salt mines in Germany. Um, and all of a sudden, this is it really in the news now. There's, a, you know, wow, that's a lot of, of art that's, that needs to be, uh, to, to be found. And then another thing, key thing that happens is uh, the museum world is, a, is rocked in January 1998 by the New York Attorney General's attempt to seize um, uh, Egon Shelley's portrait of Wally um, while it was on loan to MoMA in New York by Austria's Leopold Museum, arguing it was Nazi looted art. So his court, his, his, his attempt to seize it through um, state law actually failed. The court said that state law wouldn't enable that, but what did happen is a year later, the US Customs Service actually successfully seized the painting based on US federal law, and that galvanized the museum's community. Oh no, if if we are, you know, housing or or bringing in a, an exhibition Nazi looted art, this might happen. So, so um, at about the same time, actually, just before that, um, the U.S. Association of Art Museum um, American Museum Directors, the AAMD, had convened a task force on the spoliation of art during the World War II era, and they came up with a, a set of guidelines that actually formed the basis for some principles that were then. Um, fleshed out at the Washington Conference on the Holocaust-era assets in December 1998. This conference was attended by 44 nations, 13 NGOs, U.S. and European museums, historians, art dealers. It was a big thing. Um, they all came together and they laid out a framework for increased provenance research and encouraged signatories to state, take steps to expeditiously achieve just and fair solution to art uh, looted art restitution claims. However, at the conference, the chairman did say, the conference made significant progress, this is his final closing remarks, he says, in developing specific principles and processes for achieving just and equitable solutions. These were recognized, however, as areas of general consensus, not formal agreements or binding commitments. Still, the outcome document was signed by Germany, France, the United States, Canada, and 40 other countries. And the conference did, as you can see, achieve um, a substantial degree of consensus on a set of principles dealing with provenance research um, and restitution. It encouraged research into provenance and identification of art. Uh, it called for the findings to be published. It urged the establishment of central computerized registry linking all Holocaust-era art loss databases, encouraged claimants to file claims encouraged states to expeditiously achieve just and fair solutions to restitution claims. One of the ongoing conversations is what does just mean? Who gets to decide? What does fair mean? Who gets to decide what just and fair mean? But, but it did, and it's a, it's a catchphrase now, just and fair solutions that you'll hear a lot. And, and then insurance insured, it wanted to ensure balanced membership on commissions that addressed ownership around Nazi looted art. Now this came up, I don't know if you saw in the news, uh, in 2003, Germany established a commission, it was a non-binding um, findings, but it was a commission to examine um, expropriated art uh, cases. And there were 
in the last five years, a lot of um, contention around whether or not they would allow a Jewish member on the commission. So, so this, that was in direct violation of, of the Washington Conference principles. They did actually end up allowing it, but it was quite contentious. And then it encouraged um, developing alternative dispute resolution mechanisms for ownership issues. I wish I could give a whole talk on that. It's what I do in my course at Stanford, a whole um, hour on what exists out there for ADRM mechanisms. There are some at the UN. There's one at IPO, uh, the WIPO, ICOM has a mediation procedure. I don't have time to go into it, but, but some progress has been made. Again, though, they're non mind binding. Other non binding initiatives that exist um, because of and thanks to the Washington Conference principles. Um, so, other guidelines by museums, by the American Alliance of Museums. Um, there, there's a, a, a 2000 UK spoliation advisory panel that's quite active. There's this commission I just um, talked about in Germany. Um, there are a couple of other initiatives. And then we get to the Terrorism Declaration in 2009. And this is a follow-up to the Washington Conference principles. Um, and they are really trying uh, to move things forward. And one of the things that they do is they address the issue of forced sales. So this wasn't addressed in the Washington Conference of Principles, and it's really relevant to indigenous communities. If you think about what we've already discussed about uh, colonialism and its impact on communities and, and the devastation of the cultural uh, ceremony bans, the devastation of uh, prohibiting cultural practices, um, and the removal of material in that sort of environment, um, they also focused on that at the terrorism at, the, at this conference, the Holocaust Era Assets Conference in Prague, and came up with a finding um, saying that, um, recognizing that confiscations, forced sales, and sales under duress of property were part of the persecution of these innocent people and groups, the vast majority of whom uh, died airless, and encouraging restitution um, of works taken under uh, duress um, is a really important thing to think about for both Jewish and indigenous looted treasures. So after this um, very long set, this is just one part of it, there's a whole long um, declaration that was signed by 44 nations. Um, uh, we have an explosion in, uh, and, and before this too. So, so some of these projects that I'm going to talk about right now are before um, 2009, um, and they continue through. So you can see the Cranet Art Museum has one. Nancy's doing some provenance research work here. Um, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston um, has, has a project, the Art Institute of Chicago, MoMA, obviously after the Sheila, that became of more interest to them. Um, the Met has one. The Getty Research Institute has one. Um, there's a portal now that, that, that people contribute inf uh, information on looted works to. The Government of Canada, Nancy knows all about this, the Government of Canada sponsored a um, project by six museums to investigate uh, Nazi looted works in their collections. It was a two-year project. I think it continued for a year and had some funding issues, but, um, but it was an important um, development on the Canadian scene. And, and they actually published, and you can download these best practices, and, and they published some best practices. Uh, Montreal also has a project. Uh, this project it became quite famous, the Gurlitt Collection um, Research Project. Uh, if you know a little bit about that collection, it was found in the Munich apartment of Cornelius um, Gurlitz, uh, who whose father was a, a well-known um, Nazi art dealer. And he had about 1,500, 1,200 plus works of art that were found in this tiny Munich apartment. Um, he'd been selling them at auction houses every once in a while to keep himself living. Um, and anyway, so they, they said they were going to investigate this set of paintings. To date, they've only um, determined that five of them are actually uh, looted, but uh, I guess there's some question whether or not some of that work will continue. The Bern um, Museum of Art actually uh, received the collection absent the works that were looted and returned um, by donation from Cornelius Gerlitt. 
and and then there's some controversy about around um, the Byrne Museum's accession of that collection. And anyway, it's an interesting thing you could do more research on. It, um, it highlights lots of the issues. So one of the other things that um, also important happened in the provenance research and restitution field was the negotiation over a 20-year, 20 20-year, two-decade period and eventual adoption at the UN General Assembly of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And so in 2007, 144 nations, excluding Canada, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand, who have large indigenous populations, all voted to adopt this um, uh, important human rights document. So those four actually did, two, three years later, endorse it um, with some hesitation around you, mostly land um, issues. But um, anyway, it's a really important human rights document. It was negotiated over a long period among the nations, including consultation um, with indigenous peoples. And um, one of the important things it does is talk about this issue that came up in the Terrorism Declaration, which is this issue of did actually indigenous peoples properly consent to the removal of their material? Um, and so it, at several points in the Declaration, talks about the concept of free, prior, and informed consent. And one of the things we need to think about is could indigenous peoples have had really free, prior, and informed consent to the removal of their uh, cultural and spiritual objects in the atmosphere of such um, cultural genocide is what the TRC has recognized. So, so I'm, I'm highlighting uh, Article 11 there for you. Article 12 is also important um, because it talks about uh, repatriation of ceremonial objects and human remains and the right to manifest, um, practice, develop, and speak and teach spiritual and religious traditions right to maintain, protect, and have access in privacy to their religious and cultural sites, and the right to use and control of ceremonial objects. That's all really important if you think about it in the provenance realm, because if you're doing research on, on these objects, then, then with UNDRIP you should be working with indigenous peoples on, on the provenance research. And then Article 31 is also important. I want to talk about a case study now. Um, this is a sad story, um, but, but it illustrates uh, brings together some of the things we've just been talking about. So this is the uh, Glenbow Museum in Calgary, Alberta. Now, ironically, this museum was the subject of a lot of controversy in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, there was an exhibition there called The Spirit Sings at the time of the Winter Olympics in 89, and um, there was an international fur over um, some display and sponsorship issues. Um, that ended up in a boycott by a number of museums um, non that refused to participate in the exhibition. And, and it prompted the creation in Canada of a task force on museums and, and, um, and First Nations, and they came up with a report. This revolutionized the Canadian landscape and decolonized Canadian museum practices in a way that hadn't happened before, that, that introspection by the museum community of what um, of the, uh, how they approached indigenous peoples and treasures in their, in their um, collections. And here we go again with the Glenbow Museum, again the site of fur. Uh, in September, 11th, uh, September 2011, the Glenbow Museum auctioned off 220 uh, North American native objects that had, it had just deaccessioned from its collections, allegedly to improve storage capacity and raise funds for other collections. So the lack of provenance for these items was also highlighted by the museum. And in an interview on a Canadian national radio show, As It Happens, the Glenbow Museum curator Jerry Connedy insisted that the provenance of the items was not easy to determine, as many had originally been accessioned into the museum collections with vague cultural and geographical de details. Another spokesperson for the Glenbow alleged that the museum tried to find homes or pieces um, it was going to deaccession with the First Nations museums um, uh, that it, that it um, was in contact with, arguing that because the museum is owned by the province of Alberta, it could not transfer them to individuals. It had to transfer them to museums. And so here you can see one of the items that was um, included in the auction. Uh, it's a pipe bag, and, and the auction included snowshoes, clothing, uh, this is an Ojibwa ceremonial pipe bag, which is considered a sacred object, uh, and objects detailed, uh, decorated with eagle feathers. The auction actually went ahead on September 27, 2011, 
and numerous indigenous peoples from across the country attended in person to try and stop the sale and demand the items be returned to their cultural owners. Nonetheless, all 220 items sold, netting about $86,000 for the museum. So this caused furor um, among indigenous peoples, and they were outraged that the objects were auctioned off instead of repatriated, arguing that more First Nations should have been consulted on provenance, and they could have identified um, the objects and the families associated with them through stylistic attributes, materials, and maker's marks. So Pekani Chief Dr. Reg Kroshu, who is currently a senator at the University of Calgary, similarly said that the Glenbow should have done more work to, with First Nations and individuals, not just with museums, before the sale began. Indeed, many, in people, many Indigenous peoples in Canada want more connection with and consultation over their treasures currently in museum collections. They may also want them to be repatriated under land claim settlement agreements or pursuant to negotiated agreements with museums because there is no um, repatriation legislation in most of Canada. Um, but that repatriation process can take years. Communities might, might not be ready to receive the objects, and, and they want better relationships with museums, and they want access to the, their treasures in the museums. So in the interim, they want to be able to negotiate that. One problem, though, is they don't know where their treasures are. Um, as Simshian mus musician and um, cultural pra practitioner and actual mu museum professional, Samson Bryant said recently at the conference that you can see on the slide here, the Indigenous Perspectives on Repatriation. Um, it was held in Kelowna in March 2017. He stood up on the stage and he said, where's that? He, the room is full of museum professionals and he said, where's our stuff and how do we get it back? Where's our stuff and how do we get it back? Well, some of it, actually quite a lot of it, is sitting in um, some basement storage of museums with large ethnographic collections. This is um, true of most museums that have ethnographic collections. Seven years ago, I was doing graduate research on indigenous cultural heritage repatriation issues, and I visited the basement of a premier ethnographic museum and almost fainted at the size of this football field size. <laughs> it felt like it, it probably wasn't, but um, room full of cultural and spiritual objects piled high on storage shelves. And I turned to the curator and I said, how, for how much of this do you have provenance information? And she said, 20%. You know, it, and so thousands upon thousands of cultural treasures are sitting on these storage shelves in basements, some imbued with living spirits, and their cultural owners don't even know where they are. But the holdings of these, museum, of, of these museums in British Columbia, where, where I'm from, apparently are nothing compared to what is in New York and Washington. Um, you can see here a quote from Bill McLennan, who's a longtime curator, um, now curator emeriti at the University of British Columbia's Museum of Anthropology. And um, uh, apparently there's a lot of work to do, basically, on, on, mu on museum storages. Um, some of this work would, you know, had, to be, had to get done under NAGPRA. I'm going to describe that in a second. But um, the US has legislation that we don't have in Canada. But, but before I get there, I just want to say that, that it's understandable why this work isn't being done, right? It, it's very extensive. It, it's expensive for museums to do such huge research projects. They don't have the human resources to do that. They, might not, they don't have the funding. Um, and and it, it also involves complex political situations. A lot of these objects will have overlapping claims by indigenous nations. And so you have to be willing to deal with, with that scenario as well. Um, as a museum. I recently gave a talk um, in Ottawa uh, in which I ar actually argued in favor of having repatriation legislation in Canada at, at both federal and provincial levels. Um, and similar to the Native American Graves Repatriation Protection and Repatriation Act, which is often referred to as NAGPRA. Um, so NAGPRA, when it became law in 1991, obligated federally funded institutions to inventory and notify, notify potential claimants about certain classes of Native American, Native Hawaiian cultural items within a certain number of years. And 
And this is important to, th to think about because uh, it, the, actually the Smithsonian, the National Museum of the American Indian, had at this point a claim into it for a repatriation of, repatriation of some uh, Kwakwakiwak regalia. And they actually had to put the claim on hold. And for two years, they were fully occupied with inventorying their collections from 1991 onward. It was a huge undertaking, and it was ob obligatory under um, NAGPRA. So there was a representative from a Canadian museum attending my talk in Ottawa um, who said, well, this wouldn't work for our museum because uh, our policy is to insist that nations uh, resolve disputes um, over objects between themselves before approaching the museum um, regarding engaging in repatriation discussions. And, you know, that's an easier way to do things, but um, NAG NAGPRA does it a different way. But I asked her how many objects they'd repatriated since 1991, and she said they'd engaged in over 300 consultations. And I think, she, and I might be wrong, I think she said they'd repatriated approximately 38 items, 40 items. And I said, well, NAGPRA was enacted in 1991, and since then, museums in the United States have notified claimants of about 1.5 million cultural items and re repatriated over half a million. So the numbers I said to her speak for themselves from my perspective and argue in favor of enacting legislation. Um, and I think it becomes even more compelling when you think about the calls to action of the 2015 final report of Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So the TRC final report uh, called on the federal and provincial museums um, uh, to do certain things. One of them, um, so it called on institutions to, to, and, and the federal and provincial governments to implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and come up with action plans to do that. And then another part of the uh, TRC report called on museums um, to uh, implement, implement UNDRIP and develop better relationships with indigenous peoples. So um, that's not to say that they're not already doing a concerted job. I have lots of um, smart, um, devoted curator friends who are working very hard with communities um, on um, returning the objects uh, that, that were taken illicitly. And there is, um, at the University of British Columbia Museum of Anthropology, this really great network that you can access yourselves um, that was developed by MOA, the Musqueam Indian Band, the Stolo Nation, Stolo Tribal Council, and the Umista Cultural Society up in Alert Bay, British Columbia. They launched this reciprocal research network. And it's a collection of 12 partner organizations, an online um, web-based um, resource which links the collections of these of 12 partner organizations like the NMAI and, and Smithsonian in the United States, Oxford and Cambridge Museums in England. There's a, a long list of them. You can go on the site and see what they are. And it fosters uh, exchanges of knowledge and, it, and uh, part of its goal is to invite originating communities and institutions to carry out individual or collaborative cultural heritage research projects. Um, but uh, the reality is that in, in Canada, uh, unfortunately, we, because we don't have something like NAGPRA, our statistics in terms of the numbers of re objects that we re repatriate just aren't as high as they are in the United States. So NAGPRA is not perfect, though. Right? There are flaws with the legislation. Um, for instance, it doesn't um, require uh, U.S. federally funded uh, museums to repatriate to anyone other than a federally registered um, in, uh, in the Indian tribe or Native American um, tribe, so uh, or Native Native Hawaiian um, band, and so, so that's one flaw because there are lots of nations in the United States that aren't federally rec recognized, lots of communities. So that's one flaw. Um, also, the border between Canada and U.S. you know is artificial for a lot of the nations, and they can't um, the ones that are in Canada aren't eligible to have things repatriated. They can ask their their um, friends in the community right on the other side of that border to have it repatriated and then get it back that way. But um, the other thing that it doesn't do is it doesn't apply to objects that were taken outside of the United States. So it's not going to apply to objects in foreign museums. And that's the next case study, um, which if you follow 
the New York Times or the Washington, all the main papers. This was in the news all the time in 2013, 2014, 2015. Um, starting in 20, April 2013, auction houses in Paris started um, auctioning off illicitly acquired Native American sacred objects, and they did it every six months. Um, and the one that did it the most and continues to do it is an auction house called Eve, Eve. Um, and among these um, spiritual sacred objects are katsunam, which belong to the Hopi people of Arizona communally. They're not individually owned, they're owned by the community. And so as background, the Hopi live on a 2,500 square mile reservation in, on a high plateau in Arizona. They live in 12 villages on the top of three mesas, points of land that are raised several miles apart. They still inhabit the oldest continually inhabited village in the United States established in 1100 AD. And they carry on their traditional spiritual and ceremonial practices involving their katsunam, um, much as they have throughout much of the last millennium since time immemorial, despite the fact that in 1882 the U.S. federal government ordered an end to all heatheneth, heathenish dances and ceremonies on reservations due to their great hindrance to civilization. So in Canada we had the same thing happen. The federal government banned cultural ceremonies like the potlatch on the northwest coast. The same thing happened in the United States. And like in Canada, uh, Hopi children were removed forcibly to uh, an Indian boarding school. This was the Keams Canyon boarding school. And starting in 1887, they went there. It was 35 miles away. And they were made to abandon their Hopi identity, identity and traditional ways. Um, shortly after that, about a decade after that, um, the, the governor, six years after that, the government opened a day school in one of the villages. Um, but the Hopi traditional um, practitioners, some of them refused to send their children. They didn't want them being civilized. And so when certain Hopi parents uh, refused to send their children, um, they were arrested and sent to Alcatraz prison in San Francisco for over a year. So, so that's some of the backdrop to the Hopi's failed efforts that I'll now describe to uh, stop the sales of their sacred objects, their Katsunam friends, in both French courts and in the French administrative tribunal that oversees auctions, the Conseil des Ventes Volontaires. I'll say it's CVV because that's a big mouthful. So that's the administrative tribunal that oversees auctions. So one of the problems the Hopi faced uh, was that the court and administrative tribunal decided that the Hopi lacked standing to bring a claim because they lacked legal personality. So the tribe is federally recognized. It has a constitution, has bylaws, and just like the organ uh, organization's cultural survivor, survival and the Holocaust Art Restitution Project, um, those are NGOs that were given standing because they are corporations. Um, to represent the Hopi in court. The Hopi couldn't get standing in either the court or the administrative tribunal. Another problem that they faced was um, that the court didn't accept that the sale posed a risk of imminent damage to the Hopi, saying the Hopi could always try and recover the katsunam through court proceedings. Now, that actually was impossible because, as you might know if you know a little bit about auctions, so auction houses don't give out the names of sellers or purchasers um, generally, and Eve did not do this either, refused to, to give out the names. So that meant it was going to be practically impossible for uh, the Hopi to bring a suit to recover. So the Hopi were also not able to establish that, that um, the Katsunam were illegally or illicitly removed from Hopi territory in violation of Hopi law um, because they were removed without communal agreement. So French law actually is based on a, a model of individual ownership, and it doesn't recognize communal ownership. So again, Hopi, Hopi law and their form of ownership um, wasn't recognized by the French courts. The court also refused to stop the auction on the grounds that it was um, that, that certain public morals, that's a loose translation, public morals opposed the sale, because uh, they said, okay, well, the Hopi, the Katsunam aren't human remains. If they were, that would be another thing. And the sacred character of the Katsunam is not a recognized legal instrument. The Katsunam are imbued with spirits, but um, that's not a legal argument that the, that the French courts um, were accepting. They also refused to apply foreign law, so they refused to apply 
um, NAGPRA, they refused to apply the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, prohibiting the sale of objects used in religious ceremonies. They said it doesn't apply in France. And they also pointed out, well, NAGPRA, even if we applied it, doesn't prevent the private sale of Native American ceremony objects. That's true. It prevents, um, so, uh, it, it, it applies to federally funded institutions. So, so the court refused to respect the provisions of UNDRIP also. This is, uh, for me, the, the really frustrating part. France actually, unlike Canada, United States, New Zealand, and Australia, actually adopted, voted to adopt UNDRIP at the UN um, General Assembly. Um, but when asked if they would apply the provisions of it as part in the, in the courts, they refused. And then finally, to add insult to injury, the CVV refused to apply its own code of ethics for auction houses, which requires halting a sale involving objects with suspicious provenance, even though under Hopi law, as I've said, title to the Katsunum could not have vested with the current possessor. So, so, so what are the lessons we can learn from this ongoing um, saga? Uh, so NAGPRA has little effect on foreign courts. Um, even though France endorsed under it, it doesn't take, seem to take its commitment too seriously. Other courts do, by the way. There are other courts around the world that do apply, that have um, relied on UNDRIP in making um, court decisions. France decided not to. Proof of ownership and theft of Native American sacred objects is hard to establish. Um, there's a lack of understanding in the auction house world about the meaning of sacred and cultural objects. Um, so interestingly, some people have actually bought, gone to the auction, bought the sacred objects, and taken them to the Hopi. Um, and, and, um, and while that's viewed as very generous, some, one of the things we examine in, in my course is, um, do, does that help in the end, does, or does that create a market? And so it's a complicated question um, for everyone involved. But certainly, I'm not saying that at all to undermine the, the good intentions of the people that did that. And um, we need a better way to resolve these disputes is the final takeaway. Um, so actually, while this was going on, Christopher Marinello, who's the head of Art Recovery International, uh, pointed out that, look, we have a, a you know, what well, he said, convention. So actually, there are declarations signed by over you know, 44 countries have signed these Washington Commons principles and terrorism declaration. He said that hasn't been done for Native American artifacts. So the auction houses hide behind the fact that consigners have these items in good faith. They just assume they do. But that's not morally right, he said. We don't support that. The two parties should discuss the provenance of the objects to determine if they should go on public sale with the members of the tribes who are claiming the items. Um, and I agree with that and something to work towards. So has anything changed since 2013? Yes. So all of this in the United States, a couple of really important things have happened. And it could be as a result, and it is a lot, as a result of the sales in Paris, because it, it galvanized um, the Acoma Pueblo, the Navajo, the Hopi, all of whom had um, sacred material that were being auctioned off, ceremonial material, and galvanized them into action. They had a lot of um, senators and, and government um, bodies behind them. And, and what ended up happening is they drafted uh, a resolution and a piece of legislation or, that is still a bill. But um, in December 2016, they passed the Protection of the Right of Tribes to Stop the Export of Cultural and Traditional Patrimony Resolution. And, and it does a lot of important things. It condemns the theft, illegal possession, or sale, transfer, and export of tribal cultural items. So it calls on the government in consultation with Native Americans, including traditional Native American spiritual leaders, leaders to take affirmative action to stop the practices and secure repatriation. It supports the ongoing efforts of the US Comptroller General to study the scope of illegal trafficking in tribal cultural items domestically and internationally and identify in consultation with Native Americans steps to end illegal trafficking and export of cultural items and secure repatriation to the appropriate Native Americans. Supports the development of explicit restrictions on export and encourages states and local governments to work cooperatively to deter theft, illegal possession, sale, transfer, and export, and, and secure repatriation. So it's, it, it's a really um, good initiative. The problem is it's a resolution. It's not binding. 
And so there's also uh, an act bef <clears throat> that, that um, it was a bill, 3127, a Senate bill. It's also been put forward, con um, forward in Congress called the Safeguard Tribal Objects of Patrimony Act of 2016. And it does a few um, important things. It um, increases the maximum term of imprisonment from five to 10 years for individuals convicted more than once of illegal trafficking. It bans the export, like the patrimony resolution, the protect patrimony resolution, and sets penalties for violations of the ban. It grants immunity from criminal prosecution. This is the thing that's really caused problems, I think. Grants immunity from criminal prosecution to anyone who voluntarily repatriates to the appropriate tribe all the Native American cultural objects in the person's possession not later than two years after enactment of this bill. This caused panic in the in the tribal dealers community. You know, two years to hand over anything that might have been illicitly acquired and you won't be prosecuted. So, um, and, and then it, it creates a system for um, reporting and, and working together. But what happened is the tribal um, art dealers associations were really quick to, to criticize um, the proposed legislation saying, well, we haven't been told how we identify objects that can be sold. And, um, and, and they also asked um, how US authorities were gonna make that determination. Um, and then also some were worried that increased criminal penalties for trafficking may lead some collectors to dispose of items rather than return them to the tribes. Um, so, the, so it's a complicated bill. There's a lot of pushback from ATADA, A -T -A -D -A, um, the, art dealer, the Tribal Art Dealers Association, against this piece of legislation. It has not gone forward and been put into law, um, and, and, I, and it's still being negotiated. Um, but uh, truth be told, both of these um, initiatives have had some important uh, effect. Uh, even though they don't cover um, objects already outside the US, they only ban export, they have helped increase sensitivity among collectors and dealers regarding Native American cultural items, and they've chilled the illicit trade in Native American cultural island items domestically. Um, it's hard to determine how much, but that's the feeling <laughs> the feeling um, is, is that th these are important and they've had impact. So north of the 49th parallel, we've also had some important things happen in the last few years. Um, so following our TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Com Commission report in December 2015, um, the uh, Canadian Museums Association um, was asked to undertake in collaboration with Indigenous Peoples, our national review of museum policies and best practices um, since the you know, the task force that I mentioned in late 80s, early 90s, they, they're going to update the, the thinking and findings and um, also analyze their compliance with UNDRIP. So they t the CMA took that call to action seriously and 20, in 2017 announced a multi-year project led by Turtle Clan member Jameson Brandt, whom you see in this photo on the left. Um, she's an experienced museum professional who, for the past 11 years, has headed the Aboriginal Training Program in Museum Practices at the Canadian Museum of History in Ottawa. And um, another thing that happened is the Royal BC Museum, this is where I'm from in Victoria, um, also responded to the TRC call to action proactively. It created a repatriation project with funding from the BC government and led by Haida Nation Museum professional Lucy Bell that's going to develop a consultation framework and decision-making process um, to establish working relationships with First Nation communities, hold consultation sessions, provide advice to communities. It's going to research, assess, and review repatriation requests, both in accordance with and outside the BC treaty process. It's going to maintain an inventory of BC First Nation objects located outside of their source communities. It's a big project. Um, and it's gonna help facilitate the transfer of important cultural property from other museums when requested by the source community. So I think what we're seeing is across the border, on both sides of the border, um, at least in North America, a renewed commitment, and especially in Canada because of the TRC, to real consultation with communities by the Canadian government and its agencies on heritage-related issues, and handing over implementation of programs to First Nations Indigenous peoples.
Um, also a recognition that indigenous peoples are best placed to make decisions about indigenous heritage issues and a recognition that wellness is integrally linked to repatriation and, and a commitment to implementing and respecting UNDRIP. So I just want to finish with a very, I know I'm a little over time, a very quick summary of, of similarities and differences in the way that indigenous and Jewish looted treasures are being treated. So as we saw, both groups have genocide, cultural and physical genocide as a backdrop to the removals. And there are now provenance research projects for both groups. There are more for Nazi looted art. Um, it's definitely something that museums um, need to work on is, is catching up in terms of uh, provenance research on indigenous um, looted objects, culture, cu cultural material. In the US, there's legislation now for both types of looted objects. There's NAGPRA, and there's, and, uh, there's proposed STOP Act, which may come in. Um, but but um, outside of the US, we're not, we don't have the same thing. We don't have repatriation le legislation in Canada. Um, there isn't anything like NAGPRA anywhere else in the world. Um, and, um, and the situation still um, doesn't have a, a binding legal framework. Um, in Europe, good faith, faith, good faith purchasers can acquire good title, um, and so that's a challenge um, to overcome. And um, and there's still a statute of limitations for Nazi looted works, and we need to think about that carefully. Should there be a six-year statute of limitations for treasures removed against a backdrop of genocide? So. Um, you know, that's something that I think was probably negotiated. I didn't take part in that negotiation, but you know, the, the number of years is, is um, something to think about. Should, should there be any statute of limitations in that, in that, res in, in that situation? So the differences. Um, the presumption, presumption of illicit acquisition uh, has led to provenance research projects for Nazi literature art. I think if we have provenance gaps that we see um, in, if you're doing provenance research between 1933 and 1945, you know, you worry about that. Um, there's no similar yet presumption for indigenous material in museums. If it's um, there before 1950, in the 1950s, the ban on cultural ceremonies was lifted. And there's some thinking in the museum community that, well, if it's taken between the 1880s and 1950s, probably we have to keep it on the, the treaty table, keep it on. Um, after the 50s, maybe we don't have to put it on the, the table. But, um, but still, we need to think carefully about the how the material was acquired, the situation in indigenous communities when the material was removed. Um, it, and, we, and, and museums need to think about that. Lawmakers need to think about that. UNDRIP still doesn't get applied in courts um, around the world to any great extent. It's something that the international community needs to think more carefully about because they did um, spend <coughs> decades negotiating the document. And, and um, it would seem important, since it's such an important human rights document, to uh, apply it more in the courts. Uh, the STOP Act, as I said, uh, has had a lot of resistance from tribal art dealers and hasn't been made into law. That needs to be thought about carefully. Um, but the HERE Act, uh, the Holocaust Expropriate Art Recovery Act, quickly became law and it had some immediate effect, like we saw in the Casserer case. And, um, and, and that's sort of a positive development. So there's good and there's bad. Um, I think it's a, it's a very um, complex um, and, and always developing, always evolving field. Every time I give a talk, I have to update, you know, because there's always lots going on. Um, and, and so it's a very exciting field, to, um, an interesting field, and meaningful and important field. Um, and I'll stop there, and I'll open up the floor for questions. So thank you for listening.